on Breakfast Extra, where we serve the latest news with a side of bewilderment and a generous sprinkle of snark. Confusion, ladies and gentlemen, is the order of the day, and Nigeria seems to have mastered it. Since the start of 2024, we've seen a cascade of court orders that could make a soap opera look straightforward. Trust me. From political power plays to royal rumbles, let's wade through the absurdity that defines confusion in Nigeria. First up, River State, where the political circus never ends. The latest act in the never-ending drama, a federal court just voided the sacking of 27 defectors to the APC, declaring their positions still open for grabs. Now, if you're confused, join the club. This is the epitome of chaos, where courtrooms overrule political maneuvers, leaving everyone wondering who's actually in charge. Then there's Kano, the land of the Emirates telenovela. The state is in a tizzle, splits between Team Sanusi Lamido Sanusi and Team Adubairo. Both claim the throne, and the result is a tangled mess of loyalties and legalities. Confusion here isn't just a feeling, it's a full-blown spectacle. So hey, grab your popcorns because this traditional and political soap opera shows no sign of ending anytime soon. And let's not forget the latest twist in Edo State's political thriller. A federal high court in Abuja just threw out the PDP primary that crowned Asua Igodalu as their governorship candidate. Why, you ask? Well, apparently, the primary was more of a charade, they say, ignoring the Electoral Act 2022 and the party's own rules. The exclusion of 381 delegates and some creative result manufacturing by returning officers didn't help their case. It's confusion on steroids this time, with legal fireworks lightening up the political skyline. And in fact, if you look up, they say, confusion in the English dictionary, you just might find Nigeria as a definition. But what else is new? This is Nigeria. Good morning, everybody, and welcome. My name is Mazino Confucius Appeal, and I'm delighted to welcome you to another edition of Breakfast Extra. Joining me today, as always, my co-host, the ever insightful Judith Confucia TV. Hey, Judith, want to say hi, at least? Oh, Give us a wave. No, there I should say hi, I'm confused. <laughs> we'll sort that confusion out in a bit. Now, after weeks of relentless rain, we're here to bring you a warm, pleasant start to your morning as we dive into the chaos that is our new landscape. Grab your coffee, settle in, and let's take in the analysis of the week's most bewildering stories together. Stay tuned because this is going to be an enlightening ride. Welcome to Breakfast Extra. And welcome again to Breakfast Extra for you this Saturday morning. Now, today's got, of course, is parked. Uh, Packs lined up of stories uh, to sink your teeth into today. And we start with, of course, the very harrowing uh, details and intelligence report, or lack thereof, of the recent uh, uh, of intelligence report of the recent suicide bombing in Borno State. And then we'll move uh, to the rising calls uh, from Nigerian citizens to bear arms in the face of escalating uh, insecurity. We'll also cover the growing clamor for the release of Namdi Kanu and discuss the potential implication of the UK election outcomes on Nigeria's uh, international relations with the UK. Now, with, there's so much to pack, Fais, of course, but uh, without further ado, let's first dive into uh, today's dailies. And to begin with, we'll start with Punch newspaper. Thank you very much, Confucia. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the punch newspaper this morning for a Saturday. Lagos, Edo, Akwai Bome Boy plan camps for flood victims. Put measures in place for security Sokoto Delta to relocate residents from flood prone areas. Nema, Mum, as floods ravage 10 states. Now that's very worrying mm -hmm. um, because this should be the one time where we're hearing plenty from Nema. And I do remember that this is either a perennial or an annual thing, especially if you come from the Niger Delta, where your entire village is underwater. No going back during June, July, August. Um, a relocation of these uh, people or potential victims. Well, uh, we've had cases of racketeering um, in the past. But let's move on real quick to other headlines from the Punch newspaper for, for a Saturday. Meet Nigeria-born British who emerged winners in uh, UK general elections. Uh, Tinubu EU world leaders salute new UK PM Stammer. And after my PhD, I in, intend pursuing a career as a lecturer, says Ogun Monak. At the bottom here, food crisis. 82 million Nigerians may go hungry, UN warns. An inside online matchmaking platform where desperate singles are exposed to good, bad dates. 
And finally, for the Punch newspaper, Abako name brought me fame, says Charles Olumo. And that's all for the front page of uh, the Punch newspaper. Yes, indeed. We'll move away from that now to our very next newspaper that pulls up now on your screen. Let's take a look at the next one. There we go. Next one we're taking there is the Vanguard. And the very first story that jumps at you there is crude oil theft. Why government can't stop Lagos Abuja Cartel. At the bottom there it says Edo will be okay. As you see, uh, all the uh, majority uh, leaders, there, or the major opponents or uh, those that are running for office for the Edo gubernatorial elections. You're going to see those stories there uh, when you pick up uh, the, the Vanguard uh, newspaper. And also at the very top there, you see Rivers Crisis as well, another state there. Pressure mounts on Fubara to dump PDP, page 12. Uh, why, can't, uh, he, why he can't go to LP? The worst is over. He reacts to appeal court ruling. Resurgency of kidnapping in Southwest. Afeni Ferre, Yoruba elders raise the alarm uh, and say renewed banditry in the region disturbing, disheartening. And that story is on page 14. Edo, a ghost of Zamfara Rivers 2019 APC primaries haunting PDP in 2024. That's a question that's going to be answered inside of page 18. Uh, right there, when you go there at the other side of the newspaper there, there are more headlines there. My fears for APC in 2027. Mogalu, uh, that's on page 13. I refuse to be Davido's sex slave. And that's from Sophie Momodu there, uh, the, do the mother of his daughter there. That story is on page four, and I'm sure this is following all of the uh, 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 the uh, um, court, court from yesterday. yeah the custody battle that yeah. they have in court. That's what I was look that's what I was looking for. Uh, on that story, the crude oil theft story. Why government can't stop Lagos or Buja cartel? On uh, page ten, Pandaf uh, uh, Niger Delta leaders activities challenge uh, President Tunumbu to summon political will to stop it. And that story is on page 10. And that's all for Saturday Vanguard. Real quick now, mm -hmm. let's do The Guardian. Big story here. Local refineries got the picture of Dangote just on it. Why crisis over crude supply will persist. That on page two will make for a very interesting weekend mm -hmm. read. As everybody seems to think that Dangote and his refinery would be the messiah for Nigeria and the petroleum sector. Um, the um, OKLO imperative, uh, remember Earth's only natural nuclear reactor, and periscoping Fulu Adeboye's passion and Christian education in the making of a complete child. At the bottom for the Guardian, Shitima urges a shift to non-oil sector to unlock potential. Oh, <laughs> we're just finding this out. <laughs> like 10 years late, NLC demands immediate reversal of new electricity tariff hike. And I'm wondering where they've been the past two weeks regarding this issue. But thank goodness, at least it's resurfaced into our consciousness on and also on the headlines of the dailies. Uh, we'll move away from The Guardian now to our very next story. Well, that's all. Yeah, that's indeed. what they've told us. <laughs> and that's all of the dailies that we're taking for today. But not to worry, because coming up right next is plenty lined up just for you right here inside of uh, the Breakfast Extra for Saturday morning. Stay with us. Welcome once again. Our first big report this morning. As we navigate through the peak of rainy season, Nigeria is facing heightened concerns over flooding, particularly in Lagos State and several other regions warned by the Nigeria Meteorological Agency. That's NIMIT. Now, NIMIT has issued alerts for increased rainfall activities across the country throughout July with a particular emphasis on the north and north central states. This forecast includes predictions of both intensified and more frequent downpours in the south, where cities are likely to experience cooler temperatures due to persistent cloudy conditions. Now, however, alongside these predictions of heavy rains, Nimitz has also cautioned about potential dry spells affecting central and northern states by the end of the month. Hmm. Now, in Lagos, Nigeria's largest city, the reality of this forecast has already manifested in recent weeks. Exceeding predicted levels, heavy rainfall has triggered flash floods along major roads, exacerbating the city's long-standing drainage issues. Now, just earlier this month, torrential downpours left many motorists and residents stranded in stagnant uh, flood waters, severely affecting areas along uh, and around Iyanowuru and Olokpomeji.
prompting urgent calls for motorists to seek alternative routes. Now, during this week, our correspondent Bettina uh, was out and she also had a report on that, which we're going to discuss uh, during the course of this program. Now we're joined by Bettina Nwelli herself, the reporter on that bit. And of course, she's joining us to talk about exactly how the instance played out through the entire week. Bettina, good morning. Good to have you. Good morning, Thank you so much for having me. Thank mm -hmm. you for joining us. And also joining us to shed light on these critical weather patterns as well. And their, and their implications as well is environmentalist Deji Akinkbelu. He's a co-founder of Rethinking Cities. Uh, Cities. Good morning and Good morning. welcome. Good morning. Thanks Good for having me. Oh, Good Thank morning, Ryan. Right. Good to have you here. Um, I'd like to start with Bettina, who made the report from uh, Thursday or was it Wednesday. Bettina, you were out. You visited a couple of homes, I think in Surulay or so, if I'm not mistaken. Can you give us a first-hand instance of how that went, uh, the people you spoke to, how they felt, and uh, the experience in general? Okay, so on Thursday, I visited Shomolu community. Um, the first area that I went to was badly hit. We had families who moved from their mattresses to fridges to personal effects were all damaged. I'm talking about families with children. Uh, somebody described the situation to me as praying to God for a waterbed and then waking up in the pool of water in the middle of the night. And then yesterday, I visited another area in the same Shomolu and I discovered that another man's fence was pulled down from the pressure of the floods uh, because his house is situated just behind a canal. Now, this same flood took his dog, who um, means a lot to him, and he, he was very sad about that. And then we also had another canal region in the same Shomolu, which um, kind of portrayed a bit of what the problems were to us. Now, earlier in February, uh, the government, NAFTA, had put a ban on sachet alcohol because of the environmental menace it was portraying. But this particular uh, canal that I visited in Shomolu yesterday, you would see loads and packs of uh, sachet alcohol that has clogged the drainages of that canal. Now, people around there also mentioned how the government hasn't been there to clean up the canal in a while, which may also result to the flooding that we are facing currently. They say that this is not the first time flooding has happened, but it has been a long time since they had this volume of floods to stop them in that region. So it's quite heartbreaking to see that, um, you know, the government is working hard. I, I must commend them on that. I've seen the Minister of Environment moving around. But at the same time, I think more still needs to be done. And individuals, you and I need to take responsibility for all these things. Because when we say, oh, the government must do this or do that, the governments are not the ones coming to our backyards to plug these canals, to plug our waters. So we also have to take responsibility. I think from the government, from citizens, we all need to work together to make sure that we conquer this menace. If not, I'm afraid what will happen the next time we have this amount of rainfall in Lagos. Wow. Well, I mean, a case needs to be made also as well when it comes to the, the wetlands, right? Olokpomeji was, was never supposed to be a place that was, that was supposed to be settled by people or a residential area. And there are many wetlands that, that are supposed to be nature's way to tackle flooding, but they have also been sold as well. But let me come to you here in the studio, uh, DG. With Lagos experiencing, exper experiencing severe flooding, yes. flash flooding that we've seen uh, from uh, Wednesday, and Nimitz warning of heightened uh, rainfall, not just any kind of rain, but torrential rain across states as well. It begs to ask the question, how prepared should the states that are on high alert be uh, towards the rainy season as we get into uh, higher uh, rainfalls? Yeah, so it's quite sad. We, go, we keep going around the same vicious circle every year. <laughs> I keep doing this same interview every year whenever it rains. Uh, we keep saying the same old story. Um, making the same complaints. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, of course, the Lagos State Government had been on the rampage trying to clear canals and coal. So, I mean, we've had several demolitions. But I, I would say that the state of preparedness, yet even at that fact, um, is not um, optimum in any way. Um, some actions, as far as I'm concerned, uh, were pretty much very misplaced. Uh, take, for instance, Mendy the house that was demolished at Mende. I had to take a drone there, and I, I flew over that land. I flew over the canal. The canal had more problems of it being clogged up than the house that was built on it. Mm. It's a long stretch of a canal that's been blocked. And you had this block of flats of 15 
just occupying a very little. And the priority was to demolish the house, not to even clear the canal. And as a time I have my drone footages and I can show the commissioner, the place is clogged up. For many, many years in a city like Lagos, budgetary spent on drainage clear clearing has been very, very poor. And you can't also do it just as the state government. You have canals that are for federal, you have for state, the ones that are supposed to be managed by local government. And that's one thing I keep saying about a city like Lagos. You, keep, you want to manage Lagos centrally. And people go online and they type to the commissioner, in my area in uh, Ajangbadi, it's blocked. <laughs> and that person in Lekki, Ajawu, and so everybody is pulling the ears of a commissioner from the north, south, and the east of the state. state. And we are saying that we are working effectively. It's so no clear plan. No, that's not <laughs> effectiveness. I that, think if you widen that from Lagos now and start to go to the north and the north yeah. central as well. Um, I mean, we're a resident in, in Lagos, and so yeah. we sort of understand what yeah. it's going on on ground. What about those other states? Yeah, I've been to Orashi River before. Um, um, Orashi um, is in the east there. I've seen the impact, how the, the river overflows, affects the communities, how the water gets up there. Uh, we, I, uh, to me, I think it's just some window dressing and lip service that we see more of. And people just making claims and saying, you mentioned wetland. And the Lagos State Commissioner for Environment said emphatically that Lagos has a wetland policy. Please, let us publish that policy. Let us see it. Mm -hmm. Because the last I know of that policy was a draft in 2027, where a public gathering, uh, a public hearing was held. The document today has not come live, which will stipulate how our wetlands are going to be protected. There was a ministerial press briefing in 2018, and the commissioner said, we have barricaded the wetlands in Ekwe, and uh, elsewhere. Is that all? How do we optimally use these wetlands for them to be protected? The Lekki Conservation Center that you have on Lekki right there, imagine you don't have it. What do you think would have become of that area, of that place? Why don't we have similar stuff in, within, this, uh, within mainland? Mm. There is a wetland at uh, Antony, uh, Antony Bus Stop, Castles Hotel, I'm not trying to advertise yeah. anybody. I, I know the one that goes right down to, comes down to Mende, yeah. from Mende now goes to Mubolaji Bankantoni Way. In 2018 or there, about when I think I visited with some journalists, I mean, the land was still even open now, it's closing up. With buildings? With, with, with structure. buildings, yes, yeah, structures so, are coming up. So I, I'm noting that you're making reference to a governor's problem or policy problem yeah. or infrastructure, should I yeah. say, development, town planning yeah. problem. Yeah. And um, yeah. our correspondent, Bettina, uh, made mention of, uh, I think it's more a personal, Bettina, I, I want to I come back to Bettina and ask, now in your um, um, research or in, while you were out there, you visited Shomoli, you said. Now, I noted that one of the victims actually noted that she had never experienced that, and that wasn't the first time that she was living there. So this is a new problem for her. So do you, are you, are you, do you think it's getting worse, this flooding problem in that area? Absolutely. I think it, it is getting worse. In fact, one of the residents also mentioned that the canal near their area, they are the ones who come together as a community, pay people to clean it up from time to time. If not, it would have been much worse than what I met on the day that I went. So, yes, for some regions that didn't used to have flood in Chumulu, now they are seeing flood. For some areas, it was a normal thing they always used to say. But you see, when it's now traveling to regions where they didn't experience it before, then we know that there's a new problem that is brewing up. Also talking to us earlier, you noted that it was a, an individual, or rather, how do I put it? Uh, oh, sorry, a conscientious sorry. problem with Nigerians. We are not taking care of our environment. You'd mentioned uh, paper, uh, or rather nylon sachets and all of that that was banned by NAVDAC earlier being perhaps maybe a problem. Am I correct? Absolutely. We even found styrofoam packs that have also been banned. Now I'm wondering where those styrofoam packs came from because they are no longer in the market, but we're still seeing them in the canal. So this tells you that it's been a while that that canal has been cleaned up. Okay. So now that you've noted that, back to you, DG. Yeah. While you're yeah. pointing to the government not yeah. being responsible to their uh, duties, yeah. there's also you and I who yeah. are also yeah, responsible. Yeah, people have for the a responsibility. As well. One of the challenges of a city like Lagos is waste management practice in different communities, as you have it. If probably you have the privilege of living in a gated estate, there's a way your estate manages, waste. and you probably not have this problem. But we have lots of high density, low income areas. One of the things that we have failed as a people is to understand our, the behavioral patterns of our people. 
And whether you like it or not, you put a law in place, some people are going to break it. <laughs> Nobody, that's the reason why it's called the law in any case. And that's why you have to pick on people who, 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 are, who, who are guilty. But however, this is where the hard work of governance is. It's, not you, it's about you being able to understand how the people work. Mm -hmm. They now make the system work for them. So you talk about banning of styrofoams and all of that. We argued that that was rather just one quick one, not well thought through. Out of the several items in the waste management, uh, in the waste mm -hmm. catalog, styrofoam is just how many in it? Then there's, you, it was not a well concerted effort. One of the things we've advocated for is let us have a policy, a plastic waste policy, for instance, that encourages recycling very easily within the city. You understand? When government deliberately begins to help to see that the practice of recycling is done quickly. Do you see tires on Nagos roads? No. I, I note the guys who pick it up every morning, however. Because there is value it's in exact. tires. Just use your used tire. Just toss it outside. You won't find it the next day. It is because something is in place whereby it is being put in use. The PSP system has failed in certain areas of the city of Lagos. That is the fact. The PSP that is working in Ikoye cannot work in Ajangbadi. You tell them to be paying every month to pick up their waste. I've, I've been part of several community meetings to meet with PSP operators and community members. How will this be effective? So it's not just about pointing fingers at people and saying they're behaving badly. Yes, people must take personal responsibility to take care of their environment. Very, very important. But you also have to put mechanisms, policies, actions in place that support their lifestyle. How do, you, how do we go into communities and pick up waste of high-density areas on a daily basis, three times, three times in a week? What is the effective mode of payment for them? What is, what, how, how much are these people willing to part away with for their waste to be picked up? Mm. Lagos started having this problem. Immediately, you started banning informal waste pickers. Mm. People patronized informal waste pickers. They will come, and the guy comes, knocks, and dumps the waste. But you said their operations are now illegal. What have you put in place? What, have, what you have put in place now, is it more effective? You decided to criminalize a practice that has been in existence in the city of Lagos for over 30, 40 years, and you're trying to replace it with a model, and you complain that you have a challenge. I'm not saying people are not responsible. What has even become a pattern for a lot of PSPs is that in a lot of communities, there's this thing about they bring up their waste to the median, and then the truck will come and pick it up. But immediately the rain comes. It, it takes and they it go away. to a, a gully nearby, and they thrust that thing all yeah. into the water, yeah, that story into, the, into the drainage. Yeah. It's wild. Well, now, to give a bit of context, I, I, to, to just have a look at what was really on the ground. Sometimes you only see things through our perspective, and that's why we're so thankful for our reporters who are always on the ground. Take a look at Bettina's report that she filed this week. Take a look. This week, Lagos has been battered by relentless rain and severe flooding, throwing daily life into chaos and sparking serious concerns. The torrential downpours began early Monday morning and have hardly let up since, inundating several parts of the state and causing widespread disruption. The process of converting the wetland into livable space was done in many areas exceedingly irresponsibly. But the process of that reclaiming now impacted so negatively on the capability of that wetland to get rid of the water when the heavy rains come, because that's what the wetlands were doing in years gone by. But we now went and broke that cycle in many areas in Leki by blocking what should have been natural areas for passage of the rainwater. Vehicles that cannot withstand the pressure of the rain break down, contributing to the already abnormal traffic. New Central's correspondent reported severe flooding at Yanawaru Olokomeji, triggering a massive traffic snarl stretching all the way to Alakpare bus stop, Wemko Junction in Agege, and in Shomolu.
The economic fallout is staggering. Markets and businesses in the hardest hit areas are closed, resulting in crippling financial losses. While some flooded areas and canals are finally being cleared, experts argue that a proactive approach could have mitigated this disaster. But what you sow is what you reap. So you, individual out there, for your neighbor's sake, do not throw your plastic on the road again. Even if you have to put it in your pocket, put it in your pocket. My God, until you find somewhere where you can put those little plastic bags in a safe place, some kind of dustbin like this. Because if you throw it on the road, it's going to go and block the drain. That can now cause flooding, which could end up killing somebody. And you will get the consequences. On July 1, the Nigerian Meteorological Agency issued an alert on its X handle, predicting a significant surge in rainfall intensity and frequency across northern and north central states. The agency cautioned citizens to brace for more downpours in the coming days, urging everyone to stay informed with weather updates and take necessary precautions. Despite the challenges, the resilient spirit of Lagos remains unshaken as residents eagerly await decisive action from the government to rescue their state. In Lagos, for New Central, Bettina Nwili. And that report today is from Bettina Nwili there uh, from rainfalls, flash flooding that we saw from torrential rainfalls uh, from the early hours of Wednesday all the way. It was a rainy Wednesday right here in the city of Lagos. And afterwards were uh, warnings from Nimet uh, alerting the several states that uh, there will be torrential rains uh, so far so good. We wait to see how it is. But uh, we've had Deji Akinpelu. He's been here with us in the studio, environmentalist, as well as uh, Bettina Onweli, who joined us via video chat. We've got, we're pressed for time, right? So final words from both of our guests. Lasting solutions moving forward. I'll start with you, Bettina. Okay, so I would say that um, I'm, I'm of the belief that we human beings are naturally rebellious by nature. So until we have consequences for our actions, um, we will not do the right thing. So in terms of throwing trash outside and clogging the drainages, I think the government needs to place consequences on this action, just like how it was when people crossed the roads and the airport. When you throw stuff out from the bus, from your vehicle, or just even walking, I think people need consequences for their actions, and then we can now move ahead to create a better Lagos. Yeah, oh, thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll take it maybe from where, where she stopped. Um, I think f for me, I think we need to be more deliberate about the actions being taken by the government um, in the sense that we need to begin to be more conscious of how we want to do our flood risk assessment in the city of Lagos. A flood risk assessment needs to be conducted and infrastructure needs to be put in place. Not window dressing, not you trying to make it look like you're working, but we deliberately are um, putting things out there and uh, saying, oh, these are the dangers that we are facing. These are the new emerging areas that are likely to be flooded. And also setting ahead emergency response procedure. So it's not just about you announcing to people, it's going to flood, leave where you are. No, what is government's emergency response to what is about to happen? We will begin to see new places where flood will, will happen unexpectedly. But how are you helping the people? Where can, they, where can they call? Where are the temporary homes that people can move into if you have a situation? So it's a global problem, but we need to begin to look for local solutions. Mm. I want to say thank you very much to Jack and Pelum, and mm. also thank you very much to you, Bettina, out there, our waterbender. Uh, looking forward to seeing you back at work uh, maybe Monday. Enjoy your weekend, and thank you very much again. Thank you, Andrew, thank you so much. You're welcome. Coming up next, we turn our attention to a developing controversy surrounding Nigeria's alleged $150 billion deal with Samoa, reportedly including clauses on LGBTQ promotion. Stay tuned as we stare into the contentious issue on Breakfast Extra. 
And now on to our big story for today, or second big story, or rather our first big story. Now, the controversial $150 billion Sabua deal has stirred significant debate and outrage across Nigeria with clerics, rights activists, and civil society organizations and their CSOs now vehemently opposing, opposing its clauses, allegedly promoting LGBTQ rights. Named after the Pacific Island where it was signed, the agreement reportedly mandates support for LGBTQ rights as a prerequisite for economic aid to underdeveloped nations. Now, this has sparked a severe backlash from countries upholding Islamic and Christian values, citing cultural sensitivities and concerns over 70. Now, amidst this opera, Nigeria's Minister of Budget and Economic Planning, Abubakar Tiku Bagudu, confirmed the country's participation in the Samoa Agreement. Uh, this was uh, during an EU reception in Abuja, though his media assistant later clarified that the focus was on economic development, not LGBTQ issues. Uh, critics like Sonny Ekosi, chair, uh, chair of the Human, Rights, uh, Human and Constitutional Rights Committee of the African Bar Association, condemned the agreement as a threat to Nigeria's sovereignty, alleging it legalizes practices like LGBTQ rights and abortion contrary to Nigerian laws and values. Hmm. So joining us today to discuss the implications of Nigeria's involvement in the Samoa deal is Sam Kabo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria. Good morning, sir, and welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you also joining this. us, Sonny Ekuosi, Chairman, Human and Constitutional Rights Committee, Africa Bar Association. Welcome, sir. He's in the studio here with Thank us. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, it's no longer an allegation that... Uh, the Samoa Agreement contains LGBT clauses. It is, it is the fact, because um, I participated in the negotiation of that agreement. I am the chair of the Human and Constitutional Rights Committee of the African Bar as, as, Association. And uh, I go to the United Nations, so I'm familiar with United Nations euphemisms. I'm also familiar with the European Union euphemisms. Since the year 2019, the European Union have been traversing several African countries. Okay. And right. lobbying for this agreement to be signed. Nigeria said they were not going to sign. Mm -hmm. That was as at November 15, 2023. So Nigeria I, I said we were not going to, to sign. We we're going to get I'll, to I'll let you get to that, Sam. Yeah. But I wanted to start with uh, um, Sam Kabo, who we have online. So, sir, so if you're with us, we'd like to know how does the Samoa Agreement specifically impact Nigeria's legislative framework regarding LGBTQ rights and related issues? We are aware that it is an economic deal or a trade deal, but many have said that this LGBTQ nuance is being sneaked in. How does it implicate um, the situation? <laughs> Well, uh, let me start by saying for now, it's at the realm of policy. Uh, mind you, irrespective of the color of that agreement, until the promoters of the agreement take the further step of ensuring that it is domesticated, uh, it may not in any way affect our laws. Yes, we could say in the area of implementation, because in any case, at the end of the day, it is the executive that would be the one implementing our laws. Mind you, there are laws signing gay marriage in Nigeria. And those laws, for now, until they are, amended or repealed their sacrosanct. No executive agreement in any guise or sense would override those laws. All right, sir. Now, um, we'll come to you, uh, yes, Mr. I mean, Sonny. Let me respond to the senior advocate, uh, let me okay. the that, uh, He has rightly stated the law by virtue of Section 12 of the 1999 Constitution, all treaties that can be implemented in Nigeria has to be ratified and domesticated so it becomes a part of the Nigerian law. That is the law. But the Samoa Agreement is caused in such a devious way that once pen is put to paper in signing, it becomes operational in the country. They are aware of domestication, and that's why they made it in such a way that once you put pen to paper, 
it becomes operational. And that's why we advise that they should not sign in the first place. I know about domestication, I know about I mean ratification. I had a meeting with members of some members of National Assembly, including the chairman in charge of committee on treaties, protocols. It was in that meeting, and they said they were not even aware that Nigeria has signed. National Assembly represents you and I. Some more agreement is going to be tabled in National Assembly on Tuesday. Sorry, but they are so they are so mind. They, are, they say they are not aware that Nigeria that has, has signed. Been signed. But it has been signed. It who, has been signed. Who signed? Who signed was a Nigerian diplomat. I would not like Which, to mention his name. Oh, Nigerian wow. diplomat in Brussels. He signed on 28th of June 2024. Who managed to sign, we don't know. Who asked to sign, we don't know. But Nigeria has said they were not going to sign. But we're able to convince them that Luko, some more agreement is so dangerous. 34 African, Caribbean, Pacific countries have not signed, including Namibia. And what Namibia signed, the refuse to sign was that the agreement has no interpretation clause. I okay? Th I think it's best to ask now, if you're, if you're saying that all of these countries have not signed yes. and that because they are drawing back because of that clause of LGBTQ plus uh, support, then it begs to ask the question, what exactly is, is the fine print of this agreement in terms of uh, the potential, economic potential uh, oh, benefits the, for the country is, or it is, drawbacks? It is a you know, post-Cotonou post agreement, which is purely an economic... Cotonou agreement is a purely economic agreement. It, it didn't contain any of these clauses. Mm -hmm. These clauses were inserted from, 20, from 2001. Sorry, if you will, Mr. Sonny, Mr. Sam, if you would allow me, let me read these articles from the agreement. This is Article 2.5 of the agreement. The parties shall systematically promote a gender perspective and ensure that gender equality is mainstreamed across all policies. It wasn't specific on LGBTQ. Yes, it was. Then, you know, you know how Article 29.5 says the parties shall support universal access to sexual and reproductive health commodities and healthcare services, including for family planning, information and education, and the integration of reproductive health into national strategies and programs. So yeah, let me, let me respond. Yes, it's I, not. I, I, I would I, like I, to. I, I started by saying that this is. Um, I'm familiar with United Nations euphemisms and European Union you know, euphemisms. At the UN, I was there in March. At the UN, the word LGBT is not always. I mean, mentioned. They use euphemism, gender equality. Gender, gender is not different between male and female. Gender now connotes LGBT, connotes sexual orientation. Could not transgender even. So that innocent word, the world has changed, okay? The world has changed. I'm happy that, I mean, that you're having me in your studio because mm -hmm. I would say I'm an expert in this, so. Yes. Okay. Um, well, let's go to Mr. Sam, why don't we, uh, Judith? Uh, well, Mr. Sam, uh, let's, uh, let's talk about this. I was asking about the, uh, the, the, the potentials of this, right? But also, you know, considering the strong cultural religious objectives within Nigeria that we, that we do have. Uh, what are the political ramifications for the government? Now that this has been signed, they're saying that the, the House did not know about this, the Assembly didn't know about this, a diplomat that we will mention have now signed this, with, and that nobody asked for this signal. Let's, let's try to clarify this. What will be uh, you know, the, the, the political ramifications of all of this? Now, let me, let me, let me just chip in there. And not in Sonny's lifetime or your lifetime, uh, my own lifetime, I'm much, much older anyway, would you have LGBT promoted in Nigeria? Uh, you see, they say uh, the sweetness of the pudding is in the eating or the devil is in the detail. Yes, you know, executives and whatever, especially diplomats, they always want to do the fine line. They always want to look good in the eye of their kids when they go outside the country. And many times they sign so many treaties. We have 1,001 treaties that are signed that are lying dormant. It is not the signing that I'm worried about. It is when Nigeria wants to take advantage of that, where you now have to have the country-specific details in the agreement. That's when these issues become very, very potent. It is good that we are actually putting some emphasis and some sort of concerns now, now that they have not taken it to the uh, National Assembly. And in any case, 
I do not think it's a prerequisite that whatever any diplomat or any executive wants to do out there, he has to consult the National Assembly. Yet it would be good for him so that uh, at the end of the day, when now comes to them, he would have made them ready. But it is not the law and it's not a requirement. But what is the requirement is that you cannot put it in place, you cannot implement it until you have their own authorization in the form of what? A law. And that's where the ratification comes in, the domestication of the law comes in. So for now, in terms of, yes, uh, the political uh, ramification of that, the politicians know uh, what sentiments play in their fortunes, in their political fortunes. Uh, they would answer that. I, as a lawyer, I am a little bit much more tilted towards concerns about the legal uh, narratives that we give. We shouldn't give the fearful narrative that haven't been signed, that would by itself manacle Nigeria or force Nigeria to start uh, promoting LGBT. No. Kabu, but the, the point is, is that Nigeria already has a subsisting law from 2014 about um, um, well, uh, sexual orientation, uh, or rather, um, gay, uh, or what's the word now, um, if you'll help me out. Um, LGBTQ marriage rights. rights. Oh. Now, if the Samoa law has even a semblance of a nuance to that, and we have signed it, does that not put us under obligation to actually follow through if we want to access the monies that are available, the $150 billion that are available. Doesn't it seem like we did this signing under the pressure of accessing these funds? And I'll let Mr. Sonny also uh, touch on that. But real quick, if you can do, if you can summarize, uh, summarize your response on that. Now you are talking. You know, no foreign money comes to you uh, thrown at you for free. They come with their conditions, or what we call conditionalities. Uh, usually, you, you, you see what happens here. For every round of what they call investment or support to Africa, they bring all sorts of conditions that you have to fulfill before you can access those funds. And most of the time, our colleagues who are in the civil society, they are not... Uh, in the dark, they know because they participate in, just like Sonny said there, they participate in framing the conditions for access to that money. But at the time they come within this fine package, you could call the Greek gift of saying, you must be a promoter of what? Fundamental rights. And mind you, rights vary from culture to culture. For us here, we already have those rights that we have considered very fundamental and very, very dear to us. We already stated them clearly in the Constitution. And for those other rights, some of the statutes, they have some of them, like the child rights that are themselves now subject-specific. But for today, I can tell you for free, in a country like Nigeria that is steep in religion, you don't play with that, irrespective of how um, massive the funding may be or attractive it may be. The moment you touch that threshold or you go beyond that threshold of what? Moral and social tolerance, you have this sort of pushback. And I can tell you for free, I'll come back to my word, not in your lifetime. All right, Mr. Mr. Cabo, we Nigeria need to problem. make room now for, for, for uh, Mr. Mr. Sonny to... I would thank the learner's sake. He has uh, hit the nail on the head by saying that money is always involved, the money that is assessed, you know, in this. I think we know very well that this was signed in order to spy Jonathan. No, Jonathan made anti law. So this is to make the EU happy so Nigeria will be able to assess this money. This is, this is what has happened now to sign this. But about whether it has to be domesticated before it takes place, I know very well we have gone to federal high court and the lawyer that represented the NGO that went to court where we exhibited. It's already, it's already been implemented in Nigeria. This so called thing, they don't have to wait for domestication. They are so bold. Went to federal high court. In Nigeria schools, what they are teaching them, just dead boys and just girls, we exhibited the syllabus, okay? Where they are teaching them, touch the genital organ and all that, how to, be, how to do sterilization, you know? These people are bent on 
the capital, the human capital of Africa. This is, not, this is not a conspiracy theory. I've touched it, I've seen it. I travel, you know? I, I, like I told you, I was a part of the negotiation of a similar agreement. I go to the UN. So what they are after is to decapitate the human capital of Africa. So they are teaching this in the schools. I went to court, and the federal court in Lagos, and the judge was embarrassed. This is what I said, they are teaching in the public schools. Of course, the government asked for the matter to be settled out of court they are going to remove orders for the syllabus. So is that so on the way? We, are they removing these clauses? They have, they, they have not done so. As you speak, I would like to get in touch with the uh, senior thing so that they can join us in the battle. They have not removed it. So they are taking it for granted. Before signing, before signing the summer agreement, it's been implemented piece by piece. But how is it now implemented with this, and passed with this, through all the checks? I will tell you that if, I'm a Federal Minister of um, um, Health is guilty. Federal Minister of Justice is even guilty. And Federal Minister of Education is, is guilty, OK? I go to Abuja, and I said, why do you allow this to happen in Nigeria? Where, as Lena Stick has said, where you have sensitive religious moral values, you are implementing this in Nigerian schools. They tell, if you, the, I mean, the, I mean, I mean, the syllabus, they call it uh, comprehensive sexuality education. That's, that, I mean, that's the name, because some arguments don't really contain this LGBT. It also contain comprehensive sexuality education where kids I've been told that sex is their right. Girls, boys, and girls, girls, you know? I know the schools, public schools, so mm -hmm. I can give names. So I'm not just doing theory here, OK? Mention, and that's why we are disturbed. I go about and all that and about this. Mm -hmm. In the African Bar Association, we're also worried. When we have our meeting in our last conference, South Africa, we are saying, why is this happening in Africa? Not only in Nigeria, eh? Kenya, uh, Ethiopia, <laughs> they are all being invaded well, by Mr. these Sonia people. Mr. Sonia um, we are out of time. But we wish that we could continue the conversation. <laughs> but tell you what, um, and Mrs. Sam Cabo, if yes. you're listening, we would like to still come back to this conversation. We'll back, Please yes. do not leave. Let's do the news at 9 o'clock. We'll and back. then we'll be back to continue with this conversation. Do stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I am Adibola Adidiba. We apologize for that technical glitch. Uh, let's begin in northern Nigeria, where President Bola Tinubu has called on Nigerians to unite against the common threat undermining the nation's well-being, saying the country has endured too much. He made his call on Friday during the groundbreaking ceremony for a settlement scheme for persons impacted by conflict at Tudun Biri community, a Kaduna village accidentally bombed by a military drone in December last year. Represented by Vice President Kashim Shatima, the president expressed dismay that Nigerians have been held hostage by fear and allowed preventable incidents to escalate into generational dispute. The resettlement schemes targeting communities affected by conflicts in Kaduna, Katsina, Benue, Niger, Zamfara, Sokoto, and Kebi stands as a testament to the survivors' courage and signals an end to their pessimism. The Senior Staff Association of Nigerian Universities have threatened to shut down vertices across the nation and will on Tuesday protest nationwide to press home its demands. Now, SANU and the Non-Academic Staff Union of Educational and Association Institutions have been in talks with the federal government over the four-month salary arrears owed them uh, by this borders. Now, some months back, the union embarked on a warning strike and most recently gave the government a two-week ultimatum to meet its demands. The union is accusing governments of making promises and not matching words with action, threatening to cripple activities of campuses nationwide if demands are not met. Uh, let's tell you that the House of Representatives has launched a probe into 1.5 billion naira meant for the payments of contractors, uh, but allegedly diverted by principal officers of the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs. The House Committee on Women Affairs, uh, Affairs commenced the probe in Abuja against the backdrop of petitions by contractors over non-payments of contracts executed. Kafila Togbara, chairman of the committee, said the commission initiated new contracts not captured in the 2023 budget and diverted 1.5 billion naira bin funds for old contractors. She adds that the ministry, while owing contractors, awarded fresh contracts in 15 states of the federation, which she alleged was not captured in the 2023 appropriation budget. We now move to River State, where Governor Minalaye Fubara has assured that 
his regime will not waver in its commitment to providing critical infrastructure required for the speedy development of the state. He gave the assurance on Friday while speaking to newsmen shortly after he inspected the extent of his construction work done at Zono Hospital Project at Bori Town headquarters of Kana local government area. Our correspondent, Austin Azu, tells us more. Barely 24 hours after the appeal court verdict on the River State House of Assembly crisis, Governor Similalai Fubara is here to inspect the extent of reconstruction work done at the Zona Hospital in Buri Town, headquarters of Kama local government area. The governor, accompanied by some of his cabinet members, used the occasion to address some of the concerns expressed by well-meaning people of the state over the recent pronouncements of the appeal court. I want to assure you, every one of you, and the good people of River State, that we are not deterred, we have made our promises, we will continue to give you good governance, no matter what it is. But, like I said before, the worst is over. We are moving on to ensure that we continue to provide what is needed for the development of our state. Commenting on the projects, the governor emphasized that healthcare, education, and agriculture are top priority sectors that his administration will fiercely protect, pledging to do everything possible to ensure the public can access top notch services. He also highlighted the death state of healthcare, revealing that his administration inherited no functional zonal hospitals. Determined to transform this, the governor said funds were released a month ago for the reconstruction and expansion of four zonal hospitals aiming to provide state-of-the-art health care facilities for the people. So we're here to check what they're doing because if you could remember, about a month ago, we did release money for the rehabilitation and expansion of four zonal hospitals and about, yeah, one general hospital. So we're here to check. And let me say that I'm really impressed with what I've seen. The contractors are really committed. They understand the dream and aspiration of this administration that we are people, when we make promises, we keep to our promise. The governor also assured that when completed and put to use, the facilities would meet the healthcare needs of the people within the catchment areas and address key issues in line with the sustainable development goals and policy objectives of his administration. In Rivers, for News Central, Austin Azu. Lawyers representing Aminu Ado Bayero, the 15th Emir of Kano, have pulled out from the ongoing Emirate tussle before the State High Court. On Thursday, Abdul Muhammad. Counsel to the first respondent presented an affidavit of fact, notice of appeal, and a motion up to stay proceedings urging the court to halt proceedings until the appeal court's decision. The court denied his request for adjourn adjournment, prompting Muhammad and his team to withdraw from the case. Sanusi Musa also announced the pulling out of all counsels for the first respondent. Hassan Kayure, representing other respondents, sought to overturn the Kano State Emirates Council Repeal Law and requested a fine of one billion naira against the plaintiffs. The presiding judge, Aminu Adamu Aliyu, denied the stay of the proceedings, scheduling the next hearing for July 18th. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Judith and Mazino. Thank you very much uh, there, Adiduba, and uh, welcome back inside of the studio. It's still Mazino, of course, uh, Judith Atibi here as we continue our conversation from before about the signed Samoa deal between Nigeria and, um, well, yes, yeah, Samoa. Um, this, uh, they say, has a little nuance or a little clause that has been snuck in um, that promotes LGBTQ rights in Nigeria, where we have laws subsisting where this is illegal. Um, well, we still have with us um, Sam Kagwo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, and of course, still in the studio here with us, Zoni Ekuosi. Um, in, uh, we've been talking about this from and, before. Um, I would like to mention the area of uh, implementation of uh, some agreement even before it is a domesticated, you know. I told you that we have gone to court to question some of these things, and we have the textbook in my office. I have the teacher's manual in my office where I will have come with it where they have photograph of sterilization, their LGBT, LGBT targeted at under six years, under six years old. I have to go to the National Broadcasting Commission where they are about to show cartoons for children 
about LGBT cartoons, you know, so they want to catch them on the So before, even before someone, before signing, they are so bold to be permitting this thing because they get hold on our department ministries and all that, National Broadcasting Commission, Federal Ministry of Health, Federal Ministry of Education, and this is a bit, a bit better. Uh, after after signing, now that it has been signing now, they are going to be asking Nigeria to be sending reports to be able to assess the funding that we're talking about, or how some agreement is being implemented, irrespective of your domestic laws, of your same-sex prohibition act of 2014, which is a law, which the learners sake has mentioned that is a law in, in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. They care not about your laws. Okay, so they have, that you were gonna I, say have people, I was going to say yes. something, right? Yes. You were saying education, national broadcasting corporation, these are all heavily regulated ministries. So you're saying, and this is happening long before uh, the Samoa deal was even signed into agreement. And so it best to ask a question, given how heavily religious we are, Christianity, Islam, or traditionalists, we are very, 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 very religious people who are very, very conservative. How come no parent have raised concerns about the we curriculum have the parents, you're speaking uh, about? A committee. The parents went to court, federal high court, I told you, which I have the reach, I mean, the, the court process in my, in my office, where we exhibited what is being taught to our kids. Even universities, first year, you know, in first, in first year university, you have uh, broad courses, broad courses, you know. Right now, in universities, they have some broad courses on this, on this so-called thing. They are trying to, you know, reorient re re us from the way we are as a religious cultural people. First year university, in fact, um, a university in the north, one of the questions that was said for the students, it was terrible, to describe uh, sex, you know, how they enjoy sex as a course in the university. They were ashamed to answer it. So now that it has been signed, they are going to be asking Nigeria to send reports. Mm -hmm. They say Nigeria is not fulfilling its international obligation on Samoa. Now, because you know, you don't have to. Your laws will be there. Mr. Sonny, I ask again, <laughs> this curriculum you're speaking about, yeah. there is, there's an education system, there's a ministry, there's a board that is in charge How of curriculum. The How MP, did it slip the, from the, primary the, the, all the way to university MP, level before MP, the summer? MPRD. We got, I've written them several times, petitions to them, they say they would do something. Attaching the, you know, I'm not talking theory. I have them in my office, even biology, Physics, chemistry textbook are smeared so, with so, all so, this. So what you're saying is, or, what, or rather, what you're insinuating is that in spite of the fact that our deals like this will be domesticated based off of our own ideals and culture, that, in spite we, of all I of mean, that... You have to invite me to talk about this, uh, say, this uh, teaching this school. I think school. we should do that. I we think have to talk because, that. I mean, you're running out of time because it is actually a fact, and we've gone to court three times on this. One of them, they came to my office and they were asking... How do we settle out of class? I say, where do you smear? How can you smear thesis, chemistry textbook, and even mathematics? In mathematics, they say 20 condom minus, minus five condom. Yes, we smear with them. I'll bring it live. I'll show on screen. We would like to see that, Mr. Sam. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, 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 <laughs> very interesting. Well, Mr. Sam, by the way, uh, oh, yeah. sorry to have left you out of this conversation. Oh, yeah. But let me ask, right? Uh, and I asked this question earlier, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask this again. For those that are home sitting down and looking at this deal, $150 billion agreement, what is the economic benefits to Nigeria? Because it's, uh, signing is a different thing, but what is the economic benefits to Nigeria? I do not think that that money is uh, all of it is for Nigeria. I think it is what EU is putting on the table, and uh, the conditions we are discussing here, uh, what they have put in place to say, if you want to access this, then you should be disposed to this. Of course, we need money. Of course, uh, uh, it will take us a long time for us to uh, have the ability to catch up on our infrastructural needs. There is a lot of gap there in almost every facet of our life that would need money. And uh, if the money can come cheap, fine. But like Sonny has said, if it comes with that package that in itself mutilates our human uh, capital or sense of humanity, then it becomes a hot potato that we shouldn't uh, be bothered with. We should be looking out inwards. It is because we do not have enough resources to cater for ourselves that we, 
why we go around asking for this sort of what font that asks us to do that with ordinary we should not do. But let me don't miss this opportunity to state here. What Sony has been discussing is an effect of what the NGOs or the civil society have been doing out there. There is a failure of regulation. That regulatory uh, failure is what is expressing itself in the smuggling of this sort of um, uh, provisions or literature that Sony is quarreling with. Some states in the north, they have reacted and have asked most of those books to be withdrawn from their schools. They've done that, and I'm sure so certain uh, states are going to have a rethink and look at what the implication of the literature that is uh, that young are exposed to. We have a lot to do in terms of regulations and monitoring and oversight. The NGO society is good, but I can tell you if we leave the space to them like we've been doing, they are the ones actually that are driving in this imperial culture that we are talking about. And they are good at it because there is money to be made. They are paid handsomely and their salaries are dependent on how much of space they cover. So they come in with very fine language, fine literature, very tempting. They say, okay, we are going to do these books for you for free. We are going to, they, they take you to all sorts of courses. At the end of the day, you agree they smuggle in this thing. And the Ministry of Education by itself, I do not think they are as good as they were those days in that supervisory role. Those days, we have inspectors who go to schools regularly, and uh, the principals and the headmasters, they know, they get the books, even the notebooks, the notebooks that the teachers prepare, they make them available to the supervisors for them to look and ensure that what they are teaching according to what they approve curricula. But this is, I have not seen any inspector out there and the model of the space out there now is what? Controlled by private educators. And those ones are sometimes much more driven by the drive to make ends meet than commitment to the uh, general cultural safety of our kids. Mrs. Samkab, we want to say thank you very much for joining us today on this conversation. And of course, Mrs. Sonia Kosi, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Your insights have been very, very helpful <laughs> very on this matter. Thank you. thank you. Do stay tuned. We've got much more coming up the next one hour and some here for Breakfast Extra. Only if you stay, we'll be back. Welcome back to Breakfast Extra. It's time for one of the most anticipated segments here, The Strips, where we showcase the best editorial cartoons from throughout the week. And here to present it, but of course, yours truly, Mazino Appeal. And our first strip for today, and I hope Judith is with me because I'm going to be needing your input as we take a look at our first strip from Business Day this morning, which is going to be coming up on my screen in just about a bit. Now, let me give you guys a short story of after receiving my salaries for the month of June, got back home very happy and I say to myself, now let's take care of those bills that have been accumulating. Oh, then there's power, remember there's a new tariff hike, and then there's this and then there's that, and then perhaps this and that. And then at the end of the day, you're left with nothing. This is a story that I'm telling from my life. Well, how about you? Perhaps maybe you have the same story as well. Judith, how did you spend your last paycheck? Oh, um... It disappeared into thin air. <laughs> thin air is not where it went. This is where it went. Yeah. Rent, bills, and debt. This I don't is... have debt in the mighty name of Jesus. Uh, Amen. Hey, listen, let's uh, do, do this. Do this. We all have debts. Let's... I don't. Hey, your television subscription is a debt. Your uh, um, internet subscription is a debt. You have to pay these. Whether you like it or not, you need them. Yeah, well, now we're talking about data. Let's talk about data depletion. All right, I'm looking at you, all you service providers. Because tell me why 60 gig is finishing within the blink of an eye. I'm looking at all of you. So this is where 62,000 
might be going uh, every single thing there civil servants are not finding it easy um, uh, just the other day, I actually did a small research. We don't know as husbands how much our wives actually help out at home because the prices have changed. We only just get the foods on our dining tables and then we eat. The other day, since my wife was away for a couple of days, I had to do all of that, go to the market, make the food and all. And I was overwhelmed with the difference in prices from the last time that I went to the market. So I know what it's like now. Uh, I didn't Nigeria. hear anything except you went to the market and you cooked. <laughs> My, uh, stopped hearing after Judith, that. Judith, I can cook and clean. I, I, can, I can cook and clean. <laughs> hey, guess we're sharing the new wage among three wild wolves. Those are the wolves. Everybody's got a couple of them. If it's not the hunger in your stomach, it's the debt that you haven't yet paid. Let's check out our next paper. This is from Business Day, by the way. But let's check out our next strip for, uh, from uh, during the week. Maybe it comes to the story. But no, Bubbles, the Guardian, very fond of bubbles, and we love the bubbles. We found this interesting. I'll read from the start. Dear workers in this state should get 35,000 naira minimum wage. Don't spend everything on uh, salaries alone, talking to her husband, who is the government. And he asks why. Well, the money you'll save will come in handy. He says it should be used to provide democracy dividends to people. She thinks differently. Exactly. You'll use it to capture some nice properties for us in um, Dubai. And he's left with a very quizzical question mark on top of his head. So where exactly is all the money's going to? People at the top, does it get to you? Have we even determined or, uh, or resolved what exactly our minimum wage is going to be? We're still at 38,000 now, aren't we, Judith? This is oh, yes, we, we are. Uh, they are at a consultation level. They want to consult with all stakeholders to come up with a potential minimum <sighs> wage that will be beneficial, not to the Nigerian worker, okay, not to organized labor, but to the government. Hey, I'm the stakeholder here. It's yes, my stomach. It's your stomach. It's everybody out there. These stakeholders, who exactly are they? Do they go through the same things that we go through? Do they have no light? Do they have to provide their own water? Do they have to? I heard that people were paying to take little short paths just to get over flood waters. You have oh, to I love waters. one of those chefs. I really do. 200 naira or so, if I'm not mistaken. It's very interesting, Nigeria, uh, and we're still on this matter of minimum wage. Oh, by the way, only just uh, yesterday, um, a labor came out uh, to tell that you must reverse the electricity hike today. Where were they for the past two weeks? I don't know if you understand, Judith. I, I didn't really hear do. anything about the hikes for two weeks and very little about the minimum wage saga. And I, I will say this, Ms. Zeno, uh, and I said this at the very beginning when Labour called off that strike. I, I said that this was bad, bad move on their own hand. They would have held their guns, got something tentative, tangible from mm. the government. But they called off the strike uh, didn't get anything tangible, and here we are. Kenya. Okay, let's move on now. <laughs> I didn't say anything. Maybe we'll go to our next oh, paper. That's a good one. Oh. <laughs> let's see what we have uh, coming up next. Another air bubble, and this one's from the Daily Trust. Of course, uh, Abulama uh, doing his thing, Mustafa. Um, Dad, uh, uh, the UN has allocated 11 billion, or rather million dollars to Nigeria to address the worsening food crisis in the country. And it says, while Nigeria is allocating uh, $100 million to buy a presidential jet. Are we still on that, Judith? Is, this, is the president still getting a new jet? I, I'm um, not well, very clear on this. You see, it's quite vague, right? Because uh, the Senate us. president has said that uh, they don't have any requests in front of them. But if they were to have, mm -hmm. they would do it because they have to make sure that the presidency does his job efficiently. And if it means a private jet, then it gets a private jet. Listen, guess. I think to uphold the sovereignty of Nigeria, our president does need to travel in style. That actually says a lot when it comes to uh, the sovereignty of any country. Um, your first uh, family or your, 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 your president is number one. And his convenience, well, especially how he gets to other nations. I also deserve them. to travel in style and not be stuck in traffic. How about you start from there, Mazzino? How about you start from there? How about you start with me, all right, me? I'm too no pretty to be sitting in traffic. I have no argument. You Thank deserve you. it as well. We all do, but that's the point. Um, regarding his uh, travel entourage and his uh, itinerary and all of that, we talked about that and the amount of wastage for an administration that came in telling about the fact that it wants to cut down on wastage. Seeing these $100 million, you know, what's it called, 
for, for new jets and all, not something that actually um, uh, talks or uh, is, is, it gives credit to um, an administration that wants to uh, curb wastage. But I digress. Let's move on now to our final, what might be our final cartoon, um, editorial cartoon for today. And that one is from Business Day once again. I love Business Day and they're very, almost very graphic uh, cartoons here. Now that is the economy, the little green van. Uh, with inflation and everything that we're going through, one broken wheel, private sector is actually upholding us is what this is telling. High interest rates and we're paying that taxes, we're still paying that cost of doing business. Of course, you know, that's going to be transferred to whoever the consumer is. It is shambles in Nigeria. However, I want to say this. For every time we come up, Judith, and talk about how bad Nigeria is, is there nothing that we can look toward or look forward to? Is there hope at the end of the tunnel for every single Nigerian here? Or are we just simply going to continue complaining about how bad things are. Is there any way out? And I love solutions because they give hope. The editorials, the news, it's all doom and gloom. What hope can we find in the situation that we find ourselves right now? Do you have any idea? Any I suggestions? do have an idea. What is it, Judith? Please. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> <clears throat> and that will be all for today as we What's now? I have a sneeze, Joe. I have a sneeze. All right, no, listen, ahead, listen, yeah. Uh, I think that we need to start to lead. Uh, our leaders need to start to be more sensitive mm -hmm. and more kind. I, they don't care. I always say this, that our leadership do not care. Because it takes, it takes from all of what we've seen, you know, to understand mm -hmm. this. Look at Ruto. Ruto had to cut oh, back on spending. Ruto. He had to he had to reduce his cabinet. Uh, he had to also mm -hmm. reduce expenditure for the first no lady president. and the second lady. No it, president. And I dare say no yeah. president, whether African or yeah. world over, has conceded yeah. more than Ruto has. To the benefit of the people, however, yeah. questions. Because, I mean, uh, if Kenya needs to make money... Uh, where is it going to get it from? How is it going to take care of infrastructure for the people at the end of the day? These are also facts that you also ca should uh, um, uh, consider but as well. But when your government Nigerian is instance, expensive? Judith, Judith, the Nigerian instance is this. At least in Kenya, Ruto listened to the youth. In Nigeria, you have to ask yourself, who's listening to the youth? Are the youth even willing to even speak? What modus operandi do they use to speak? Do they resort to violence or simply just use well, whatever tools they have at their um, disposal to make their voices heard. There are means by which we can be heard. I might not subscribe to any kind of protest or violence, but there are means by which youth can actually put their voice out there. After all, we are the greater we. I said, I said we. Am I still a youth, Judith? Yeah, of course you are. Only you're a geriatric at this <laughs> point. But yes, that's what I'm saying here. Uh, we, we speak, right? We're here. We have analysts who come here every single time. It talks about the economy, uh, politics, socioeconomic issues. Mm -hmm. We see this every single day. We also have uh, opposition as well who talk to power, like who, 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 are, who try to hold power accountable as possible. There's also uh, social media as well, where uh -huh. they, have, they have it at their fingertips. And there are representatives who are at the federal and state level who bring this issue to the fore for it to be discussed every single time. Now, the question is, do they listen? Because people are speaking up. It doesn't, I mean, we could go out with a vox pop every single day with a microphone in front of people. They, we complained about the signing of the new old anthem <laughs> as if that's a really issue. Quick, where at the same time, you know, the price of food is hiking. Now, there is now, you know, there's no lack, there's lack of intelligence we're going to be talking about when it comes to the recent suicide bombing. What are we, in the 90s, the early 2000s? And so those are the questions we start to ask. There's also insecurity in the farmers. Farmers can go back to their farm. There's also the situation that we saw earlier this week where people were uh, crowdfunding to get a family out of, you, oh, out you, of the kidnappers. You know what we're going to do next time? I think you should be the one here because sorry, you, you need a soapbox to get all this off of your chest. But you do make very important points, and you're correct. I actually agree with you. I just need us to speak out a bit more. What's your friend doing? Yellow? <laughs> He's a youth. <laughs> And I'm talking about Ngalali. No, I said Chief, or it's Chief, I don't Ch like it. Chief Ngalali. Mm -hmm. uh, we're expecting that he would be our voice um, in the corridors of power, but I, I'm not sure if I'm satisfied with his efforts. But in any case... It's too bright, you can't see. You and Ko. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that will be it for the strips for today, a Saturday morning here for Breakfast Extra. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, do stay tuned. Like Judith noted, we're going to be touching on some security issues um, regarding the bombing from last Saturday and the lack of intelligence report. Well, it did come eventually, but 
too little too late. Let's take a break. When we get back, we'll be touching that story. For the last hour of our, or rather the last quarter of our second hour here for Breakfast Extra, we talk about the tragic turn of events from last Saturday's suicide bombing in Borno State. Uh, they have once again thrust the relentless threat of Boko Haram terrorism into the national spotlight. Now the defense headquarters, in a strong condemnation, labeled these attacks as acts of cowardice by the insurgents, despite earlier claims of, of significant um, degradation of their capabilities. Now, Major General Buba Edward, Director of Defense Media Operations, expressed the military's resolve for a decisive crackdown on the terrorists, emphasizing the coordinated nature of assaults in Gwoza local government area from last Saturday. Now, the incidents unfolded in Kwisa session on Saturday afternoon, starting with a devastating attack at a wedding reception in Mararaba, uh, Hausari Street. A female suicide bomber disguised as a beggar infiltrated the gathering and triggered an improvised explosive device, which is IED, claiming multiple lives instantly. Now, before emergency responders could stabilize the situation, a second explosion rocked the same street, compounding the casualties and chaos. Now, tragically, even as troops enforced a curfew to contain the threat, a third explosion targeted the security forces themselves resulting in further uh, fatalities, including a soldier and members of hybrid forces. Now, adding to the gravity of the situation, the Coalition of United Political Parties, COP, pointedly criticized the government for consistent intelligence failures that, according to them, have emboldened terrorist groups across Nigeria. Now, COP's national spokesperson, Mark Adebayo, lamented the lack of proactive measures and effective intelligence, attributing these shortcomings to the continuous havoc wreaked on innocent uh, citizens. The tragic incident at a wedding in Goza town, where that female bomber uh, detonated the IED near military base, resulted in casualties that included a soldier underscoring the urgent need for improved security strategies. Hmm. And so joining us now to shed light on these uh, critical uh, developments is Imano Bogudu. He is our News, uh, news Central's correspondent and he joins us live. Uh, Imano, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you for doing this with us this morning. Uh, of course, you've seen the scenes on there. The situation is quite dire and completely sad, and it begs to ask a question about intelligence, all right? So given the assertions of uh, the intelligence uh, failures from COP, right, and the tragic outcomes that we've witnessed so far, how crucial is reliable intelligence in preventing such coordinated attacks? And might I add that even though I'm not even in intelligence, my years of watching Hollywood movies <laughs> have told me that when one suicide bomb has happened, yeah. there's most likely going to be a second and a third, right? And so I know this just by watching movies. And so it begs to ask the question, what happened to our intelligence? Yes, yes, yes. A lot has happened to our intelligence. And uh, during the course of my work while covering Northern Nigeria as a reporter, what I noticed is... Uh, the, the, what keeps a community safe, what keeps a state safe is the level of patriotism of the people of that state. Now, when you look at Kano, for instance, Kano was the last place we, we spent a lot of time on, where there was tension of insecurity and all that. But we noticed something about the people of Kano. They are very patriotic. They are very vigilant. They have shown a lot of love for their state. So the people of Bruno have, 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 have to do a lot of work when it comes to patriotism. There are a lot, the, the, the NGOs there who are actually, you know, you know, investing a lot of money on humanitarian aid and all that, most of invest a lot of money on patriotism. You know, you look at the body language of uh, Buba, Edward Buba, the DMO, the Director of Media Operations of the Nigeria the Defense Headquarters. He is saying that they cannot win the war without the support of the people. Now, intelligence will fail if people are not supporting it. It's only the people that can help in, 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 in gathering intelligence. A, 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 a detective cannot just go into a community on his own without, you know, the cooperation of people. So I, I think there is a where, where I would say intelligence will fail is when the people refuse to cooperate with intelligence uh, personnel, intelligence personnel, security personnel, so to say. 
Now, mm -hmm. I'm making that comparison because uh, the people of Kano have, have, and people of Kaduna State, for instance, you notice that they have been able to, you know, control some level of violence, some level of violence, violence, armed conflict due to the, you know, the daily, you know, uh, cooperation they are given with the to, to, to security agencies. But uh, we don't find that in Borno. We only see government working very hard, military working hard, you know, but the people are yet to, you know, give that support. That is the reason why you can, you can, you know, you can, you can you be tempted to say that intelligence has failed, but it hasn't failed. The only thing intelligence re really need now in Nigeria is the cooperation of the people. And I observe that as a reporter. When the people cooperate, intelligence work. When people don't cooperate, intelligence fail. And that is what really happened in, in, in Bruno. Because I remember when we were in Kano, when there was the, the issue of uh, the two Emirates, uh, the, the, where we had two contending emirs, you see supporters of Tanusi, you see supporters of uh, Bayaru carrying arms. But you don't see them fighting with those arms. No. You see, in fact, there was a time uh, in the in the in the uh, Bayoros Palace in Gidansakinasa Palace when they were doing a peaceful protest. Somebody now went and put fire on the tire, and there was smoke everywhere. They put on fire. They were not fighting. Why was putting this fire? Okay, so Emmanuel. Fire? So that's Emmanuel. So the other people failed to. Profit. That's when we have issue of failed intelligence. All right, so Emmanuel. Now, lately, especially in Katsina states, there has been calls for, well, people to be able to bear arms. This is also a report that you've um, carried through the week, uh, during the week. Now, what's the situation regarding this now? How many people are clamoring for this call? And what are the implications if it's allowed? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, another person that is calling for that is the Zamfara state governor, you know, Doda. The, the governor of Zamfara also support that notion. The Katsina governor still stands on his notion that uh, he should allow his citizens to carry arms. Now, I think, I, will tell, I can tell you, I think that the governor is probably confident of the level of patriotism of his people. That's why he's asking for them to be allowed to carry guns. Because he believes his people are not going to use the guns for something else, or for crime, or for um, 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 violence, or something. So, so the, he, the, the governor has, has the support of his neighbor, uh, uh, Governor Dauda of uh, Zamfara State. He also has support of some stakeholders within uh, that northwest region. And when you look at, uh, we, we, we show you videos. The New Central actually show you videos of people, citizens carrying arms during the Emirate Postal in, uh, in, 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 in Kano. I, I repeat, during the Emirate Postal in Kano. But those arms were not used. So nobody is trying to encourage that, but the government only make a plea. He's only making a plea that since the bandits can go into the market and buy arms, AK-47, RPG, to come and be killing people, his own people that he's ruling should also be given the, the right so that they can, they can strike a balance. So we have seen people carrying arms in northern Nigeria, defending themselves, and nothing happened. They didn't go into crime, they didn't go into violence, just that uh, uh, they, 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 they have a, a arm control. Emmanuel, arm control system that... Emmanuel, yes, yes, yes. we're pressed for time, right? And I'm so glad you're bringing up these instances of what you've seen with your own eyes of people carrying arms, especially uh, in Kano during the Emirate tussle. So it, it begs to ask the question, what then would now be the implication when we, I mean, there are fears, right? I'm, fear, I'm afraid for once. If you're saying that you're going to arm uh, regular citizens, that would most likely be people taking up arms and now being vigilantes. So what then would not be the implication generally, communally, for Nigeria? Yes, there, we know that there are a lot of implications. We cannot dodge that. We cannot dodge that. The, the implications could be uh, very, very you know, uh, precarious. It could be dangerous. Uh, but the, the implication is also having a positive side, which, which will make bandits stay away from, from attacking innocent citizens. Yes, we have to look at the, the, the risks and the gain. You know, we have to do some kind of uh, calculation. You know, that's the job of security personnel and then, of course, the civil populace we have to come together and collaborate. Tango, we have we now have the Department of Civil Military Affairs uh, in all the, uh, the arms of uh, the, the military, the Navy, the, the Defense, and the, the Air Force, and the Army. So if we can have that collaboration, we should be able to strike a balance. The implication is good and is also bad. So we we'll just look at the one that is, you know, more advantageous, the one that has more, that's an yeah. advantage uh, position, that's the one we're going to use. So I yeah. think uh, carrying arms is something that uh, the government have to look at as a second option, you know, while they are trying to, you know, put the, these, right. these bandits away. Emmanuel, I, ha 
I'll have to let you go because we're pressed for time. I'd have rough to d talk more on this, especially with your conversations with security experts and policymakers in terms of alternative solutions to providing you know, security besides citizens carrying arms. But we'll come to this conversation another time. But Emmanuel, many thanks for joining us today. Appreciate you for doing this with us. Thank you. And now we switch gears to bring you sports. And Udoka Ndoku is on standby. Udoka, good morning to you. Hello and welcome to Sports Updates on Breakfast Central. I am Odoka Njoko. Now, head coach of the Falconets, Chris Musa Danjuma, has called up four goalkeepers, eight defenders, eight midfielders, and 12 strikers to a training camp in Abuja as part of initial preparations for the FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup, Colombia 2024. Now, the first match of the tournament is just eight weeks away. Now, team captain Oluchi Ohebulim is at the top of the list with first choice goalkeeper Faith on Milano, uh, defender Shukura to Ladipo and Comfort for Lauren Shaw, and midfielders Chinyo Rekalu, Ado Yena, and Rofiat Imoran, uh, and forwards Janet Akekoro Mowe, uh, Flourish Sebastian, and Aminaz Belo also were called up. Nigeria will contend with three time winners Germany, Asian Powerhouse, Korea Republic, and South American representatives. Venezuela in Group D of the competition scheduled for three Colombian cities from 31st of August to the 22nd of September. Now, all the invited are expected on Sunday, the 7th of July. Moving on from Nigeria, let's head straight to South Africa and talk about club football as Mamelodi Sundowns have confirmed the return of Steve, Steve Compella as senior coach to assist Monkoba, who is back in charge of the side following the departure of Rolani Mokwena. The experienced Confella has served in the same role for three seasons from 2020-2021 season before leaving for a spell at Morocco Swallows and then a second stint at Lamontville Golden Harrows in the second half of the last campaign. Now, the well-traveled Confella has also previously been a head coach at the Manning Rangers, Dynamos, of course, that is also Maritzburg United, Free State Stars, Platinum Stars, Kaiser Chiefs, and Bloemfontein Celtic. He also had a stint as national under-23 coach and as assistant and caretaker coach of the Bafana Bafana. Thanks for staying with us. It is still Spot Update on Breakfast Central. Now let's go straight to football matters as France beat Portugal on penalties in the Euro 2024 quarterfinals following a goalless draw on Friday to set up a last four meeting with Spain. A, large, a largely dull 120 minutes saw both sides struggle to create clear chances in Hamburg as France goalkeeper Mike Maynan was forced into good saves to deny both Bruno Fernandes and Vitinha. And uh, talking about the full 120 minutes. Now, for Yao Felix, he was the only player to miss in the shootout, and Theo Hernandez netted the winning sports kick for uh, France. Now, for uh, Mbappe, he was also substituted uh, during the second half. Of the extra time because he could not continue because of an injury. Now for Cristiano Ronaldo, he scored his penalty and uh, he was the only one to have not scored a goal in a European competition. Talking about him failing to score in a major tournament. Now for Spain, they defeated Germany in Friday's first quarter final as Michael Marino's 119th minute header snatched a dramatic 2-1 win in the tournament. So it is France that will be taking on Spain in the semi-finals of the tournament and today England will take on Switzerland as Netherlands will take on Turkey. Moving on to the world of tennis, Britain's Emma Raducanu made a strong statement of intent by beating Greek ninth seed Maria Sakkari to reach the Wimbledon fourth round. The 21 year old who showcased some of her best tennis in a 6-2, 6-3 win has not lost a set in the first week of the championships. Now Raducanu, who has matched her career best run to the fourth round in 2021, has dropped just 11 games since coming through a tie break in her opening match. She is the first Briton through to the last 16 of this year's Wimbledon singles. So, big congratulations to Radicano. And of course, for Radicano, she'll be playing the Wimbledon mixed doubles alongside Andy Murray. And it looks forward to be an exciting one because Andy Murray is gradually saying farewell to the beautiful game of tennis. And we look forward to more exciting times for uh, the tennis legend right there. And that wraps up Spot Updates on Breakfast Central. I am Udoka Njaku. We'll go on a short break. When we come back, the show continues. 
Hello and welcome to Breakfast Headlines. I am Adebola Adeduba. We begin in northern Nigeria where President Bola Chinubu has called on Nigerians to unite against the common threat undermining the nation's well-being, saying the country has endured too much. He made a call on Friday during the groundbreaking ceremony for the resettlement scheme for persons impacted by conflict at Todunbiri community, a Kaduna village accidentally bombed by a military drone in December last year. Represented by Vice President Kashim Shatima, the President expressed dismay that Nigerians have been held hostage by fear and allowed preventable incidents escalate into generational disputes. has been long and arduous. Today, we combat in this historic community. We demonstrate our resolve to overcome adversity and build a future where each person and community sees the other as a friend and where peace and opportunity are the bad price of every citizen. The risk of the resettlement scheme for persons impacted by conflict it's a timely intervention not only to construct residences, roads, schools, and essential facilities for victims of conflict, but also to offer them a dignified environment to live and to dream. This is the promise of His Excellency, President Bola Ahmadinebu, a promise to make each Nigerian have a place of belonging and to learn to believe in Nigeria once again. The state government is working closely with federal security forces to degrade and uproot bandits from their enclaves and restore peace and stability to our troubled communities. We look forward to the day when displaced victims of banditry will return to their original communities and start the process of rebuilding their lives. The United Nations has once again forecasted that by 2030, uh, 82 million Nigerians, that is approximately 64% of the country's population, could face hunger. The organization urges the government to address uh, climate-related issues, uh, pest infestation, and other threats to agricultural productivity. This warning follows the continual rise in food prices across Nigeria. The National Bureau of Statistics reports that in May 2024, Nigeria's food inflation rate reached a historic high of 40.6%, surpassing April's rate of 40.53%. This marks the most significant annual increase in food prices since record-keeping began in 1996. Petrol queues emerged in Abuja, parts of the Niger and Nasarawa state on Friday due to the closure of many independent marketers' filling station. They last shut their outlets because they could not access petrol following the hike in the X depot price to 710 naira per litre by private depot owners. Motorists flocked to the fuel station still dispensing petrol leading to long queues at NNPC and major oil marketer stations. Independent marketers who operate over 70% of the filling station attributed the problem to the increased ex depot price. Abubakar Megandi, president of the Independent Petroleum Marketers Association, highlighted the disparity, noting that NNPC retail stations sold petrol at 617 naira per litre. The Senior Staff Association of Nigerian Universities has threatened to shut down varsities across the nation and will on Tuesday protest nationwide to press home its demands. SANO and the Non-Academic Staff Union of Educational and Associated Institutions have been in talks with the federal government over the four-month salary arrears owed their members. Some months back, the union embarked on a warning strike and most recently gave the government a two-week ultimatum to meet its demands. Let's now tell you that the House of Representatives has launched a probe into the 1.5 billion naira meant for the payments of contractors, but allegedly diverted by principal officers of the Federal Ministry of Women Affairs. The House Committee on Women Affairs commenced the probe in Abuja against the backdrop of petitions by contractors over non-payment of contracts executed. Kafilat Ogbara, chairman of the committee, said 
The ministry initiated new contracts not captured on the 2023 budget and diverted 1.5 billion naira bin funds for old contractors. Lawyers representing Aminu Ado Bayero, the 15th Emir of Kano, have pulled out from the ongoing Emirate tussle before the State High Court. On Thursday, Abdul Mohammed, counsel to first respondent, presented an affidavit of fact, a notice of appeal, and a motion to stay precedent, urging the court to hold precedent until the appeal court's decision. The court denied his request for adjournment, prompting Mohammed and his team to pull out from the case. Sanusi Musa also announced the withdrawal of all counsels for the first respondent. As Nigeria continues to look at ways to harness the numerous potential of its maritime sector, experts have advocated for sustainable practices to ensure the long-term health and productivity of its blue economy. Nigeria needs to take seriously the issue of policies and stringent regulations that support environmental protection, economic efficiency and social responsibility. The maritime industry needs to be strategic and decisive about sustainability as well as exploring the range of opportunities that the blue economy offers looking beyond the traditional shipping and port operations. Former Director General of the Nigerian Maritime Administration Agency, Nemasa, Mr. Temison Omatsheye, shared his thoughts on this. We must begin to look at the marine and blue economy as a business. Okay, where the regulation is working very well, definitely the business will thrive. But where there's stagnation in the ability for people to get um, approvals or authorizations or whatever else that is required, naturally the ministry, the ministry will stagnate and definitely investors will not be interested in coming to those ministries. I mean, why is it that we're looking at our fisheries right now? Um, foreign vessels are coming to our, our waters, they're catching fishes and they're making money from it and abroad, whereas Nigerian fishers, Nigerian trawlers are unable to do exactly the same thing and bring it to shore and feed Nigerians and also add that as an additional business to the international market. So do, there are a lot of things I need to do, but therefore what needs to happen, and I keep saying this, is that we do not have a clear-cut maritime policy, a marine and blue economic policy, which we need to develop very immediately. And aside from that, also we need to set up very quickly strategies. Find out more about the sustainability of the blue economy through the building, uh, through building strong decisions, through strategic policies and embracing technology. Families, friends and opposition politicians have attended a funeral service for Rex Amasia, the first protester killed during demonstrations over tax hikes in Nairobi on June 20th. According to the pathologist's findings, Amasia was shot in the thigh and succumbed to excessive bleeding. Crispin Odawa, Masai's father, expressed gratitude for numerous compassionate politicians and well wishes who have supported the family to ensure that Masia received a dignified farewell. And that's all on Breakfast Headlines. It's back to Judith and Mazzino. Well, thank you very much, Adidua. Looking good as usual. How's your weekend been so far, Debala? Well, panning out fine. I'm here on Sunday. I mean, that's part of my weekend. So, so far, so good. What can I say? <laughs> so it's, it's been good mm, yeah. so far. Well, hopefully, you didn't get into any of the floods from uh, during the week now, did you? I didn't get that uh, quite clearly. I was talking about the floods from during the week, the rains oh, and everything. Hopefully well, you weren't in the way of that. Well, luckily, you know, for me, uh, the day the rain commenced, I recall on Wednesday, you know, happened to be my day off. So I slept oh. all through, you know, in the cold. <laughs> and Lucky my you. Nap. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you for bringing the news. Now, do stay tuned because coming up, a short break. And then we're going to be talking about some very interesting issues here regarding, well, the uh, Kanu instance and clamor for his release. Stay tuned. This is Breakfast Extra. In recent months, the push for the release of Anamdi Kano, the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, IPOB, has intensified with over 50 House of Representatives members urging President Bola Tinubu to intervene. 
They believe that invoking the powers of the Attorney General to discontinue legal proceedings against Kanu could pave the way for peace and stability in the southeast. Now, Kanu's detention since June 2021 has led to a violent enforcement measures, including disruptive sit-at-home orders, exacerbating regional tensions. Federal lawmakers argue that his release is essential for a political solution to the unrest. Now, drawing parallels to the 1967 secessionist movement led by Colonel Odumegu Ojuku, the legislators emphasize that while both leaders face stern government responses, contemporary approaches involve legal and uh, security measures rather than military force. Hmm. Now, releasing Kanu, they assert, would foster dialogue and inclusivity, dismantling violence and promoting economic growth. They cite similar instances where it changes against high-profile individuals like Omoyele Showere and Sondi Igbo uh, were dropped, urging the same for Kanu to facilitate national unity. As Nigeria faces numerous challenges, the call for Kanu's release is seen as pivotal for de-escalating tensions and promoting a more inclusive national dialogue. So given these historical parallels and distinctions, how should we perceive the government's approach to Kano's secessionist movement compared to that of Ojuku? Are there lessons that the current administration can learn from the past to address the grievances fueling these movements uh, more effectively? So, to that end, joining us to discuss this issue are, first of Ali Umar Babangida, a security consultant, and Dr. Alex Obunya, the publicity secretary of Ohanes Indigbo Worldwide. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, again, gentlemen, we appreciate you for joining us this morning. And I'm going to start off with uh, you, uh, Mr. Babangida, and I'm going to start with security. So given your expertise in security, how do you assess the Nigeria government's response to Enam Dukanu's uh, movement compared uh, to military response uh, in previous uh, uh, successionist efforts in the case of uh, Colonel Ojuku? Well, if we look at the situation as it is today, and by the situation I mean the optics, one word for what our government is doing right now is dodgy. I said dodgy. Take a position. Are you ready to go the whole hog with Kanu, or are you going to release him? Right now what we see is um, what I want to call wish. It's dodgy. That's my just one word summation of the position right now. Okay, now I'm going to come to um, Dr. Ogbonia um, and I'm going to be asking that now with the clamor for the release of Kanu, um, what do you think this will, will foster? Do you think that, like they say, it will actually help in instances of dialogue when it comes to trying to um, get the East? Um, uh, as uh, well peaceful as it used to be. Will this open up dialogue avenues, do you think, Doctor? Uh, thank you so much. I want to thank you for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Uh, evidently, any person who has into listening to the media would understand that the uh, and position has been that uh, the issue of Hunan can have to be taken from a political dimension, uh, that is political solution to the problem of Fundam de Kano. But uh, legal, all this legal, uh, uh, this and that, from one court to the other, will not in any way solve the problem. Even before our father, uh, Chief Amechi, Basilika Amechi died, he met uh, Buhari at Abakeleke and requested him to release Fundam de Kano to him. And to be able to manage and control him and other things added to that. So we've been asking for his release. And the one thing that is clear, and I've made this in clear several, that the more he's been incarcerated, the more the demand for his release will continue to increase. For example, today about 50 members of the House of Rep have added voice. Senators of the South have added voice. And people from all over have added voice. So the, it is increasing, the number is increasing. It will come to a point where it will become uh, essentially difficult for government of Nigeria to continue to uh, uh, keep Nandekan in the prison. If you go back to history, you see what happened to Leslie Mandela. 
At a point, the government of South Africa thought they were dealing with Nelson Mandela. At the point, it became a global matter. Even when the Nelson Mandela was in detention, of course, he was being honored very often. At the point, the crescendo rose to a point that they were forced to release the Nelson Mandela. Similarly, the, what is going on in Nigeria today, by the end of, uh, by next month, more than 50 members of the House of Rep will add. The senators, other senators will join the South senators. A lot of Nigerians will continue in the clamor. And ultimately, whether our president likes it or not, he will be forced to release them the can. Because the reason and the can is to bring peace in the South. And like every human being, you know, even if it's a finger, the moment your finger begins to ache you, small finger as it is, it will affect the whole part of the body. Anybody who believe that what is happening in the South is just to the South is making a mistake about what they call a system. In any system, any part of the system, it becomes, it might become dysfunctional. It affects the entire system. That is how Nigeria is. When there is insecurity in the South, is inadvertently, wittingly or wittingly, it will definitely affect all parts of Nigeria. But some people do not know. But global community, the world, the global community, they know that. And, and, and things are not working well, at least in one part of Nigeria. I think it's Nigeria, the word Nigeria is Nigeria. It's, it's, it's crazy that we're investors. It means we are losing the economy. It creates insecurity and so on and so forth. And people always try to realize that and the country is like expression. It's like a symbol. It's like identity of what is happening in the house southeast. It characterizes the event in the house southeast. It characterizes unemployment. It characterizes alienation from center of power. It characterizes marginalization. It characterizes indignities and inequity to the people of southeast. It characterizes all forms of discrimination. That's what Nam Dekano represents. And of course, what is Nam Dekano saying? He's saying, instead of continuing in this condition, allow my people to go. To what Nam Dekano is. And you look at what happened 2023 election. It exemplified the whole thing. When it was clear, it was the turn of Saturday. A lot of conspiracy theories and uh, shenanigans began to arise. All this is in order to sideline the people. And the candidate is saying, instead of this thing, continue this way. Allow my people to go. So when you are talking about political solution, not kinetic police, say, well, see, let us say that after all, the government of Nigeria had once called the people of Boko Haram with negotiation and discussion. Can they call IPOP and the can group for discussion and negotiation? What is our political solution? What is the problem? The problem is when Buhari was there, the police service chiefs were there. And no, no people were under the eligible or fit to hold any of the offices. They say that, they say that we worry any people. Even if you release an American today, and you continue the industry. Dr. Alex, if you keep going, again. we might have to cut you because we need to go to our next guest. Thank you very much. Now, you just made cases for... for, for you just made case, Dr. Alex. Uh, just for a second, so we can we can you know make sure that everyone has their say. Uh, let me come to you, Mr. Babangeda. He's making a case that his release would would ensure uh, inclusivity, but also peace. But how certain are we of this peace if a, if uh, Nam Dekano is indeed released? Indeed, that is left to be seen. If you observe of my opening statement where the optics were dodgy on the part of uh, the federal government. But then, other than the optics, we also have the dynamics of this situation. And the dynamics are what uh, Dr. Alex is trying to speak about. At a point, even if one who is complicit has everything against him, over a period of time, if nothing concrete is done about him, you will turn him from a villain to a hero. The federal government need not fall into that cul-de-sac. What needs to be done now is simple. They need to reach an agreement with the subject, who is in the canoe. And having reached an agreement, which they're going to sit down and draft, the necessary safety nets are put in place. And he is released. Probably he is even released to a group of people who are protagonists of his release. And we watch. If he goes and true to type, he keeps the peace. We build from there. If he doesn't, the federal government has what we call the monopoly of violence and the magnanimity of state. 
So we need not mince words or be dodgy about Namdi Kano at this stage or at this stage of time because truth be told, the optics and the dynamics are waning out on the side of the federal government. So exactly. they must be able to exploit these two things I've said. Okay. In the interest of peace, as we put it. Okay, so um, when we talk about release of Nandi Kano, let's talk about the mechanism. Exactly how should this release be? Is he being released to continue his IPOB movement, or is he being released to perhaps maybe quell the issues that are happening inside of the East? What exactly is he being released to go do? Foster dialogue? How exactly? Let's talk about that mechanism. Um, Mr. Liu, please. Indeed, if he has to be released, uh, the government will have to sit down, as I told you with him, and speak about the terms and conditions, if I could put it that, that way, of what we are going to call matters post his release. Definitely, he's not just going to be released and say, just go your way and keep the peace. The government has to state what their expectations are. And he himself has to be at the table to hear what... Don't forget, we are all talking about release, release. How are we sure if the government's expectations are put on the table before him, he's going to accept them? Mm. A release is not automatic. He can decide to turn the release down. After all, Nelson Mandela, whom we are quick to mention, turned release offers down a lot of times. Yes, when the apartheid regime said, come and go home on this and that time, he said, no, I'd rather stay here. Because until you give me this and this, I just don't think I should be going home. So there is what you want to call a, a situation at hand where we have to sit down, both parties, and say, you know what? Um, Namdi Kanu hasn't done anything new under the sky. Okay? And uh, we can sit down and craft a way forward, both parties to the divide, if indeed peace is what we are in this for. But if it's not about peace and each party has its own ulterior motives, but is just asking for peace so they can get him out, then we can as well just go the whole hog and lock horns. After all, we are not locking horns yet, but say, but there is no peace. Every region in this country has its own relative formula of insecurity and non-state act of violence. So that's just my position on this. We have to eyeball to eyeball, tell ourselves some truths, come to terms, put the, what do you call it now, T and C's, as you could say in your jingle, stamps and conditions, on the table and see where we go from there. Speaking of on the table and, and, you know, putting all the stats on there, let's give a bit of, you know, let's look at this, uh, take it back. The historical grievances that uh, the Southeast have faced, perceived marginalization that the Southeast has faced. Dr. Ogbonaya, do you think that Kano's release could significantly reduce tensions and lead to meaningful dialogue? Again, emphasis, emphasis on meaningful dialogue between the government and the IPOB? My question is why, and if no, why not? Okay, yeah, I can see three questions. One, uh, in the first place, it will reduce insecurity, because there are some people, some good laws who have cashed in on that, uh, the fact that they didn't have the invitation. And because of that, uh, uh, you see them uh, trying to enforce it at home every Monday. Uh, so I am sure that when that they cannot be released, the issue of sit at home on Monday will stop because there will not be any reason anymore for them to enforce it at home on Mondays in the Southeast. So that is number one. So number two, when you come to dialogue, uh, people always look at, when you look at the number cano, they are looking at the effects. They are looking at outcome. They are not looking at the cause. It's a cause and effect phenomenon. People tend to disregard why Namdekano, why the issue of IPOP, that is what had brought up IPOP in the first place. So negotiation will also look at the cause. Because we are, we are now focused on the effect. The effect is agitation, agitation. What is it that causes ag agitation? This is the issue that when we say political solution. So evidently Namdekano will not be alone in the negotiation. 
Some elders of Igbo elders of Hanese will also be part of negotiation. I don't want to believe that the Kana and Tinubu alone will sit in the negotiation. I want to believe that a few Igbo elites, a few uh, elites of the government side, will stay on, on the table to negotiate. At that point, some of this will be thrown open. And the, the truth, you know, this facts are sacred. Truth is always open and clear to everybody to understand. Some of these things are very statistical. Things you can always see yourself. The empirical evidence to show what is happening in the South East. And if you're going to ameliorate them and the evidence or guarantee assurances that it will not continue to be like this. Okay, like I said earlier, even Nandekan is released today, and then Nandekan will rise more registration continues. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. Um, now, regarding his release, oh, let's talk about if he's still kept in detention. How does that affect the situation in the um, uh, states that are advocating for um, uh, IPOP? Dr. Alex, please. If, question again. If Namikano is still kept in detention, what are the implications if the, the, the detention is continuous? Well, like I said, if we have finger, any part of your body dysfunctional is a problem. It will entirely affect the whole body. So if the insecurity in South East continues, it is gone for the whole country. The, the options are very clear. <laughs> it's not an option for peace or option for crisis. So now it is it is the benefit or advantage of Nigeria and that the country is really because it will help everybody. When you have peace in one part of the country, it has, when you have crisis or conflict or insecurity in one part of the country, continuously, evidently, it will affect the whole country. So it is the impact of Nigeria and that the country. There is also talk that uh, there are a few elements that are benefiting from his continued detention. Do you have an idea of who these elements might be or how exactly they are benefiting from the unrest that's happening in these states? Well, you can see people have, uh, have myopia, myopia, narrow thoughts, narrow thoughts, people who are narrow thinkers and myopic in their ways of life. Some people who want to cash in and benefit from a, an unusual situation or condition to their own advantage. Or we have some people, people like that. Of course, you know, but it's not for me to discuss them. These are bad elements of society. All right. Well, thank you very much. Then. Thank you so much, sir. I mean, I, I, finally, let me come to you, Mr. Vangida, just to wrap things up, right? Um, and I would like to, you were, at, at first you were talking about, you know, the government and how this is taking so long and how they need to take a stand. What would that stand look like in this situation? It's simple, as I said. Are you releasing him or are you not releasing him? Okay, this, um, I don't know how to put it now, has extended over a period. It's becoming boring. People are losing interest. Whether he's going to be released or not is key. That is one of the two possible outcomes. Now, how soon this outcome is brought about is what begins to make what I call the dynamics a bit heavier for the federal government to bear. Because the dynamics must match the optics. If you keep jumping from pillar to post and back to pillar, you are going to lose the followership, you are going to lose the consent, you are going to lose the concordance of the people. And don't forget, even in law, the law will always tend to the weaker part. So if... Nandekanu is the weaker party, and you keep playing politics with this situation. At the end of the day, you're just going to play back into square one, back to where we are coming from. So as I said, is he going to be released, or is he not going to be released? That's one bullet. There the is also a greater implication when... We have to move forward. Uh, so there's also a greater implication when it comes to um, the situation in these states, where you have a sit at home that has also resulted in the deaths of soldiers or policemen. It seems that Nigeria as a sovereignty has no grip on these states or the situation in these states. How does that implicate our security forces here? How does that implicate the sovereignty of Nigeria itself fighting a, a case of cessation? Um, Mr. I Ali. tell you, I, sorry, that's for me, right? Yes, please, go ahead. I tell you something about the armed forces of the Federal Republic. They are stretched thin. They are fighting on so many different fronts, and that too has its uh, downsides. 
soft force can be applied, wisdom can be applied, strategy can be applied in so many places. Some battlefields are closed, some are suspended, some are open, but that's a subject for another day. What I'm trying to make you understand is the issue of Biafra, the issue of Kano Namdi, as uh, uh, Dr. Alex said, had its causes. And there are quite germane causes. If we really want to get to the bottom of this, we have to sit down and first of all address these causes. The causes are not perceived, they are actual. Even though the causes still have their own causes, but we must first and foremost rise above the past and come to the present and sit together and say, okay, this is much we give, how much will you give? These are the terms, these are the conditions. Let's put it and see if we can move forward. That's the way to go. Let that happen and let it fail. Not not just continue saying no, we won't. Let it happen. Let him violate the terms of the agreement. You don't tell a man he has failed an exam because you have you are told he is not a brilliant person. Let him write it and fail. Then we can say, okay, you know what? That option and that window is closed. That's the way to move this issue forward. Or else, as I said, it's going to continue to be dodgy. That's the word for now. It's dodgy. Well, we look forward to a, to a resolution to this once and for all from both the federal government and, of course, the judicial system. As also the part of the judicial system that takes its uh, sweet time on any matter that is before it. But, gentlemen, many thanks for coming on. We appreciate you for in, deeply for your analysis and your insights on this topic. We appreciate you for coming on again. And that's Mr. Umar Aliu Babangid and also Dr. Alex Obonaya. And they both joined us today to discuss uh, uh, the call for release for Unnam Dikano. You're still watching Breakfast Extra on New Central TV. After this, there's more. Stay with us. Welcome back, and let's take your perspectives today. On this segment, Perspectives, we talk once again about the floods from last week and the warnings from Nimit. Now, in recent times, Nigeria has experienced severe flooding, with Lagos being significantly affected. Torrential rains have led to widespread inunda inundation, resulting in substantial property damage and displacement of residents. Drainage systems overwhelmed by the heavy rainfall have exacerbated the situation, leaving many areas submerged and disrupting daily lives. Now, the recurring floods highlight the urgent need for comprehensive urban planning and effective flood management strategies to mitigate future impacts and protect valuable communities. Hmm. Now, the flooding crisis in Lagos has also raised concerns about climate change and its long-term e effects on human centers. <laughs> no, urban centers, there we go. Now, rising sea levels and increased uh, precipitation uh, patterns are putting additional pressure on already stressed infrastructure. Now, residents and businesses face ongoing challenges, including health risks from waterborne diseases and economic losses due to disrupted activities. Addressing these issues required, or rather requires, a coordinated effort from both government agencies, private sectors, and local communities to enhance resilience and also ensure sustainable urban development. So, what we did was we went out to ask the Goshens what they believe might be the best solutions for climate or rather for the challenges that we're facing in Nigeria or rather in Lagos when it comes to the flash flooding. And this is what they had to say on Perspectives. Take a look. Actually, a very, very bad situation. If you um, live especially on the mainland and even most places on the island too, um, a lot of people lost a lot of properties and even there were cases of people you know who lost their lives in the whole process so it's um really not a good one and it's something that seems to have been occurring in lagos like it's not something that is just happening for the first time it's been occurring for a lot of at least for the last five years that i've been around every year is the same problems well i, I don't think it's just the government um, the people themselves also have to contribute to it. Um, simple habits like not throwing debts into the canals or the drainage ways is like a very good start. And then, because if you notice, even the, the people that sweep the way, most times they end up sweeping the sand into the canal. So over time, that could also cause like a blockage. Now on the government area, they should set up like 
take the, I believe there's like a maintenance um, body that take care of all of these things, like the environmental. So those people should be proactive with the activities. Basically, they should ensure that at least early enough, maybe within March, though it rains in Lagos almost every month, but with around March or latest April, it should be like a general thing. They should go around and ensure that all drainage areas are completely open and then the water can easily just flow through. And then there are places that actually need retrenching, like digging deep so that because the water volume coming now it's quite higher than the usual because there's like an increased rainfall. So they can dig them deeper so that the water can actually flow easily without causing all the mayhem it's causing around the town. Um it's rather a sad and saddening one because I mean certainly a majority of us are coming so I didn't think anybody really took any step in making sure that it wasn't the case after all. So I mean, yeah, yeah, we are. So I don't think it's anything new at this point. Well, I think basically one has to be, um, you know, the drainage system. It would be that maybe the government kind of some sort ensure and make sure there's like the, like the body or something. I mean, there was one time there was a, I mean, they do, um, sanitation, this environmental, and then it was a thing where every street had to clear their, their drainage. And I mean, I really don't think anybody is really enforcing that as such anymore. So I think that's, that's one thing they should go back to, basically. Oh, we have a very big, very, very big one. I feel like we're even the major problem. I mean, online which there was that, that somebody actually poured out their debts in the floor. Like, why? That's, the, that's one of the major reasons why we're here in the first place. And you see how the FNG to do that. So what every citizen should do is to make sure they practice proper waste disposal um have they should know how to dispose their waste properly i mean why throwing it in the gutter for example some people eat things on the road and it's just dumb i mean look at how dirty everywhere is certainly it's going to contribute to the flood so yeah we all have a role to play and dispose your debts properly and don't litter the environment yeah well, I mean, this, this flooding of 15 in Lagos um, is really complicated because uh, me looking at it, it costs by the drainages and uh, to the Lagos State Government, they've tried their efforts to make sure to keep Lagos clean, but in the midst of that, things are still falling apart, you know, most especially the island here. For now, there's nothing the government can do, though they can still do something very uh, effective to stop this, this uh, flooding, but it will cost them. The question is, are they willing to bring out the fund to do the needful at that time? That is the question. Yes, this thing will continue from uh, each administration from years to years. We'll be hearing this thing now. The government, nothing is being done. So it's really, it's, it's worrisome. Lagos, <laughs> Lagos is a tough state. You know, Lagos is a very tough state because you have uh, different uh, ethnicity, different tribe, different people, character of, you know, everywhere people, even though somebody could eat. Do you know that somebody could eat something in his car? He could just throw it out. Forgetting that that thing you throw out, there's a place it will store. At the end of the day, it becomes a huge problem. That is what we are facing. Lagos is too dirty. And those dirty, if you go to most drainages, you see uh, sachet water, all manner of things there. We, we have our own wrong that we contribute to that aspect. So we, the other way around, uh, we have to try our hardest. Like me, I uh, personalize this. I eat anything without being told. I can't litter the place. You can know it's very wrong. So we have a role to play to assist the government to put things in order so that things can get be uh, better for every one of us. I think I've seen a lot of places on, on the TV where there are floods. But my own uh, uh, take to that, it's not like uh, the government is not working or is not doing uh, what it's supposed to do, though there's always room for improvement on the side of the government. But I think the people as well, attitude of the people towards managing drainage, most importantly, you see a lot of people dumping refuse uh, anywhere they like, despite effort being made by the government to stop that. Uh, you know, when there is no rain, you behave the way you like. Like this season we are now, it's a repercussion season. You understand? Uh -huh. So the people also need to be sensitized or do self-sensitization. You understand? To cope uh, this uh, menace, drainage, uh, flooding uh, situation. Because at this season now, it's not affecting the government 
you know, the people, you know, at the upper uh, there is the masses that are being involved in this uh, abnormality. So I think government as well will do more. And with the people also, we also need to do more to stop this uh, uh, flood uh, issue. Uh, basically, I think um, both the government and we the citizens have huge roles to play. So I know for some time when I come online, I see this Tokumbo Wab guy, I think from the Ministry of Environment. And I think he has been doing quite a whole lot, but would like to um, admonish the government they could actually do more in terms of drainages and um, ensuring you know, they do what they ought to do. Then, of course, we the citizens also have huge roles to play. You know, people are so bad with... Um, they still throw deaths into um, these drainages, which you know create a ripple effect whereby drainages are blocked, and these are the things that lead to you know more floods and everything. But I feel that um, I mean these things happen annually, right? And we need proper and good strategy from the government to ensure that they mitigate these things because these are things we can anticipate that would happen when rain starts. So. Most times, I'm always, I always wonder that then why do we still always have these issues re reoccurring? But like I said, both the government and the citizens have video to play. I think online on Twitter yesterday, someone posted a picture of while the rain was falling, people were actually still. I would say that it's good to see that people actually take conscious efforts to note that they are also responsible for whatever situation we have during the floods. Absolutely. Like uh, one of the respondents there said, you can't just eat something and thrust it out and you think that it wouldn't matter to the environment. Right. It's an accumulation. Yeah. Sometimes we do put these instances, uh, bring them up on ourselves. Yes, well, absolutely, we do. And I'm so glad that they all did you know, take accountability one step or the mm -hmm. other to say, okay, look, we also are the issue and also that uh, Lagos as well has a refuse dumping issue. We love to litter uh, mm -hmm. as Lagosians. And so that's, uh, that's also, so it's a collective uh, problem that we all have to solve collectively, communally mm -hmm. as a people. And pretty much that brings us to the very end of today's program. It's been back to back, giving you the very best from security um, uh, down to our weather and climate change, as well as policies when it comes to the Samoa deal versus Nigeria. Which is it? Are we promoting LGBTQ plus in Nigeria or not? Well, the answers have been given out for us. And tomorrow will be another day mm. for many, many more uh, interesting and insightful discussion up in here inside of Breakfast Extra for a Sunday. So up until then, we'd like for you to join us tomorrow bright and early. But in the meantime, do not go anywhere. Mm. You want to stick it uh, right here on New Central TV because we go beyond the news and we give you the very best because coming up right after this will be time for In the Game and Udoka Umjoku is on standby with the crew to give you the very best uh, with all of the games that happened yesterday and many more to happen today as well uh, inside the world of football. And of course, also right after this, Adibola Adirugba will be on standby at 12 noon for, for the news. Yeah. All from the top of her head. Yeah. In any case, <laughs> thank you very much, everybody. See you guys tomorrow. Don't get your feet wet if it's raining where you are. Bye-bye. Catch you tomorrow morning. Stay dry.